Um, my name is Shannon Stassen, and I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator for CERTS. And welcome today to today's online presentation. Today's presentation is geothermal technology for local governments and utilities. And before we get started, if you haven't done so already, please add your name and your uh, organization, your city to the chat box. First, a little bit about the Clean Energy Resource Team or CERTS. Our mission is to connect individuals and communities in Minnesota to the resources they need to identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. We meet people exactly where they are, we convert learning into doing, and then we do it again. We strive toward inclusive access so everyone has opportunities for engagement and participation in clean energy projects and processes in Minnesota. We encourage you to submit your questions via chat today, and we'll also, uh, we're a smaller group, so um, you can unmute yourself and and ask questions as well. Um, we anticipate that there'll be other questions after the session, and we invite you to reach out to our presenter, myself, or anyone on the CERTS team for follow-up. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Roger Garten from Otter Tail Power, and he will introduce today's presenter. Roger? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I'm Roger Garden from Otter Tail Power Company. Uh, I'm a senior commercial industrial services rep here. I'm also a member of the Northwest Search Steering Committee. And I've had the pleasure of working with Ed um, over the last four years on countless uh, geothermal and ground source heat pump projects, from new construction to replacement projects um, to feasibility studies for potential future projects. And what I really like about Ed's approach is he takes a real holistic approach to geothermal design and sizing. He looks at every aspect of the building and how um, every aspect interplays with itself, how they can be optimized to both reduce first cost on a project as well as long-term operating costs. So I'm really excited about having Ed uh, before this group here. Ed Lorenz brings an educational background in environmental studies and architecture and engineering design from the University of Manitoba. He's worked, uh, he's founded multiple geothermal companies. Most recently is uh, Geo Optimize, where he helps design, size, and implement uh, ground source heat pump projects. And throughout Ed's uh, long career in the geothermal industry, he's been involved in over 30,000 tons, or if you prefer, uh, 8,000 megawatts of installed heat pump capacity. And that's on projects spanning all around the globe. So with that, I'd like to welcome today's presenter, Ed Lorenz. Thanks, Roger. Um, I guess over the years I've learned a lot of ways that don't work. So uh, hopefully I can bring some of that experience to the uh, to this group. Um, some of the projects that they're there, like as Roger mentioned, there's projects that are, that we've been involved in uh, around the world, um, various schools, um, projects in New York City, IKEA stores in Denver. Um, you know, basically looking at all kinds of places, plus a probably about 15 or so projects in Minnesota working with Otter Tail Power over the last few years. Um, so what I'll be going over is just sort of a brief overview of some of the things that really need to be considered in the design of a geothermal system. As Roger mentioned, uh, it's really important to have the opportunity to work with the design team of a building uh, or the owner of an existing building to really look at what the impact is of some of the changes that might be considered uh, for the building. Uh, the kind of glass that is installed in the building, the kind of ventilation, how the fresh air is introduced into the building, those kinds of things can have a really, really big impact on the cost and the performance of a ground source system. So one of the problems in the geothermal industry is that um, it, a lot of people perceive this as uh, having a high first cost. So that basically scares a lot of people away almost immediately. And the other problem with this industry is that there is a perceived risk to projects. Uh, you, some of you, if you've been involved in the geothermal industry at all, may well have heard of projects that have quit working or aren't working anywhere nearly as well as they could be. Um, so the design methodology that uh, looking at the whole building, looking at the mechanical system, looking at every aspect of the building is a really important uh, thing, the uh, thing in designing a geothermal system. The one thing that is uh, understood by a lot of people, or uh, perceived of by a lot of people, is that a geothermal system can, because we're eliminating the use of fossil fuels, 
or certainly reducing the use of fossil fuels, uh, the CO2 reductions can be pretty significant. And that depends on how, uh, what the CO carbon intensity is of the electricity that's being used to drive the compressors and pumps. So one of the things that's really pretty important is the size and the cost of the ground heat exchanger uh, is pretty sensitive to a number of, number of things. First of all, you've got to have a good understanding of how much energy you're dealing with, how much you're, like we're basically burying a bunch of plastic pipe in the ground and using the mass of the earth to dump heat into or pull heat from. And if we put too much heat into the ground, it's gonna get warmer and warmer and warmer. If we draw too much heat from it, it's gonna get colder and colder and colder. And pretty soon, one way or the other, if we, um, if the ground heat exchanger or the amount of pipe that we put in the ground isn't large enough, um, it can, the temperature that the heat pumps are gonna see coming from the ground heat exchanger are gonna get too cold or too warm for the heat pumps to operate efficiently and they may even quit working. The other thing that there, um, that has a big impact is what the geology is that you're dealing with. If you're working with uh, clay, that has a certain thermal conductivity, certain thermal properties that may limit how much heat you can put into that, which means you need to put more pipe in the ground. If you're putting pipe in something like granite or some uh, uh, limestone or, or bedrock or something like that, the conductivity, the heat moves more readily through the, some through different different types of rocks. And if there's groundwater flowing flowing through the uh, through the cracks and fractures in the limestone, that can further enhance the performance of the system. The other thing that is important is the amount of land area that you've got available to construct the ground heat exchanger. How, how are you going to put the pipe in the ground? In some cases, in tight urban areas, the only place to install a pipe is underneath the building. In other areas where you've got a large schoolyard, for example, um, you may be able to excavate a, a trench that may be five or six or seven feet deep or do horizontal drilling, which can be generally a lot more cost effective than drilling, you know, 300, 400, 500 feet into the ground. So part of the, one of the things that we've really done to, and really concentrated on to make these systems more cost effective to build and to operate more efficiently is look at in, the, in a fair bit of detail what the, what, how the building is being constructed what kind of glass is going into the building, what kind of roof is going off the building, how the fresh air is supplied to the building, all of those kinds of things can have a huge impact on how much energy you've got to push into the ground or pull from the ground. So looking at those kinds of things in detail uh, will help, will change the amount of energy that, you got, that you've got to deal with and will change the size and change the cost of the ground heat exchanger. So, and, and one of the problems in, in the industry is that in order to get those, num those kinds of numbers, uh, how much energy you're dealing with, you really have to do a heat loss and heat gain calculation for every single hour of the year. That way you can quantify how much energy you've got to provide to the building when you're heating it, how much you've got to take from the ground, uh, uh, you know, how much you're going to extract from the ground, or alternately when you're air conditioning the building, how much you've got to shove into the ground. And it makes a huge difference with the kind of glass that you're putting into the building and all those different kinds of things. There's so many variables that using rules of thumb can really lead you far astray. So one of the things that uh, there's, there's two common rules of thumb that are often used. And one is to determine that heating and cooling capacity required in the building is often based on how many square feet of building there is. And the common rule of thumb is 400 square feet of building equals one ton of, of cooling capacity. And Sometimes that's right, just like a clock that doesn't work is still right one, twice, a, twice a day. Uh, the other thing is that the amount of pipe that you need to put in the ground, often a uh, rule of thumb that's very often employed is you need 200 feet of drilling per ton. That's gonna change an awful lot, whether you're in drilling into limestone or granite, or whether you're drilling into clay, or whether you're drilling into silt. So it makes a huge difference. Uh, and, and no rules of thumb are available that, uh, that I know of can really take into account all those different variables. So first rule of thumb, cut off the thumbs. Um, so, and 
an, a, an example of why the rules of thumb are so misleading. If we've got three buildings, you've got a church, you've got a store, you've got a, an apartment building, um, they may have exactly the same peak heating and cooling load, 480,000 BTUs per hour in cooling, so about 40 tons, uh, and the same identical peak heating requirement, 385,000 BTUs per hour. And if we use the rules of thumb, that would suggest, because you've got 40 tons of equipment in there, that you would need about 8,000 feet of drilling based on the cooling capacity. The problem is that that doesn't take into account how many hours per day or per year that system requires cooling. A church, for example, only requires cooling for maybe three or four or five hours a week. A retail store, probably 70 or 80 hours a week simply because of how many people are in the store, um, how many lights are on in the, in the store, uh, the glass in the store is a lot different than, there, than it would be in, in a church, for example. A parking building is typically somewhere in between. So the amount of cooling that you're doing on an annual basis is a lot lower in a church than it is in, in a retail store, and a parking building is somewhere in between. The heating loads, on the other hand, are in this case are exactly the opposite. A church, for example, is sitting empty much of the week. And because you're not getting heat gain from people in the, in the church, uh, from lights in the church and those kinds of things, less activity in there, a lot more of the heat has to be taken from the ground than in a, in a retail store. In a retail store, for example, the lights and the people provide a lot of the heat for the space that doesn't need to be coming from the ground. Again, the parking building is somewhere in between, but, but even this doesn't really tell the whole picture because um, heat pumps operate with electricity. The heat that's generated by the electricity has to go somewhere. When you're cooling, that actually heat, that uh, electrical energy ends up going into the, being shoved into the ground. So that increases the, the amount of heat that's being ejected to the ground. And when you're heating, some of the compressor energy electricity used to run the compressors ends up going into the building. So what that does is take away some of the heating load and that changes the balance a bit more. So you can see that this building, the amount of heating and heating, uh, re heat rejected into the ground is very, very similar to the amount of heat that's taken from it. So this would be considered a balanced system, balanced energy load. This is a lot more unbalanced, the retail store rejects so much more heat into the ground than it pulls from it, this would be called a heating dominant project or cooling dominant project, I'm sorry. This one would be a heating dominant project because you're, reject, you're extracting more heat from the ground, even considering the compressor energy than you're dumping into it. So what that means, if you look at a typical, typical rules of thumb, the temperature range that this system is gonna operate at it's the, the church, for example, will get down to, after about 10 years of operation, get down below about 26, 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's below freezing. That's starting to reach the point where the heat pumps are maybe not going to work very well. Retail store, on the other hand, is going to get up to close to 90 degrees. And again, on the other side, when you're cooling that much, it's more difficult to reject heat into something that's already 90 degrees than it would be in, in, a, in a church where the temperature doesn't, doesn't hit six, barely hit 65 degrees. Again, the temperatures in the, apart, in the ground heat exchanger in the apartment building are somewhere in between. So what happens is that this one is gonna get too cold to operate very efficiently. This one's gonna get too warm to operate very efficiently. And just like baby bear, this one's just about right. So what that means on the temperatures that are the heat pumps are going to see over time, and this is about a 10 year period. The church is, the temperature of the ground heat exchanger is going to gradually deteriorate where it's going to get too cold. And that can happen over five or 10 or 15 years. Retail store, exactly the opposite. Meanwhile, the, the uh, apartment building is going to run happily forever. So even if you're going to make it, the ground heat exchanger a lot larger, like here, we're looking at about 8,000 feet of drilling on each. Here, we've increased it to 9,200 9, feet of drilling and even increasing it to 11,000 feet of drilling. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable decrease in temperature. 
same thing in the store. This one, in, even making the Grandier exchanger about 40 percent, you know, about 69 percent larger. That's simply going to delay the inevitable. Whereas the apartment building, because the amount of energy that you're pushing into the ground and pulling from it is fairly balanced, it's going to run happily forever, well within the operating range. And at the same time, it's 7,000 feet of drilling, not the 8,000 feet that the rules of thumb would suggest. So this one would be more would be less expensive than rules of thumb would suggest. The other two wouldn't work very well. What happens is that this one, even though it's a lot larger, is going to work less efficiently and eventually going to get to the point where it's not going to work. Whereas the, if you can balance the amount of energy you're trying to push into the ground versus how much you're pulling out, it's going to work happily forever. So one of the things that is going to drive almost anybody that's making a, uh, making, try, looking at the investment that they need to make in a ground source system is how much is it going to cost, and what's it going to what's it going to what's going to be the return on investment? It, it's almost always for most clients. It's al almost always about the money. You're looking at uh, suggesting that somebody wants to do it, install a system where they're going to get a simple payback over 35 years. Probably it's not going to happen. And even if you're looking at doing this for the environment, reducing CO2 emissions and whatever, it's almost always about the money. So different ways can be used to get pipe into the ground. Vertical boreholes, is, uh, especially in larger commercial buildings, is probably the more common, simply because it takes less space to build it. You can actually build, in some places, they built these in under the building or in actually built the, put, install the pipes in piles underneath the building. We're working on a project right now in New York City where they've got 190 some odd piles that are 120 feet deep. Those piles, the pipe in the piles will supply about 30, 35% of the heating and cooling energy for that building. Um, you're looking at uh, looking at piping being installed underneath a, uh, under, under a building. This is in Vancouver. This is in a place where you've got a lot more space to play with. Horizontal loops, if you've got space to install the pipes in the ground, uh, excavating a trench, uh, you know, five or six or seven feet deep, or drilling horizontally down to 15 or 20 or 30 feet deep, uh, can be a more cost-effective way to install pipe in the ground. Simply, it's it's just cheaper to put, build that in a lot of cases. The other option, if you happen to be near a body of water, Minnesota's got lots of lakes. Um, you can use the lakes themselves as a heat, heating and cooling source. Those lakes are in the winter, even though it's frozen on the surface. At the bottom of the lake, they're going to be about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take a little bit. And that can become a very efficient heat source as well as a, an efficient heat sink, a place to get rid of heat. Um, as mentioned, uh, installing pipes in piles, uh, installing the pipes in, in piles. If you've got a deep enough pile, you can install a lot of pipe in there fairly cost effectively. You don't have to worry about the drilling cost. All you're doing is install. Uh, attaching the pipe to the steel rebar that's installed in, that's already installed in the system. Um, in other places, people have embedded pipes in the walls of tunnels and subways and that. This is happening in Europe and in Stuttgart and in uh, a couple of other places. Uh, that can be a very cost-effective way of getting a lot of pipe to touch a lot of dirt. One of the things that we've been working on with, uh, with the help of water tail power is a tool to look at the feasibility of installing a geothermal system in a building. And what this um, website has is basically a large database of energy models of typical building types. Um, you can basically look at where the building is located. In this case, Fergus Falls, Minnesota, we're looking at a small multifamily building. Uh, there's about a dozen different types of buildings that are on a whole bunch of different sites across Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and across the country. Enter the size of the building, uh, what the alternate fuel type is, and that gives you enough information based on the type of building that you've selected to get a much better estimate of what, the, what you can do with that building. The other thing it does is look at different efficiency measures that can be introduced into the building. For example, um, this first building has got 
you're looking at just the uh, changing the glass on the building. What that does is drop the cooling loads compared to the original building. And it actually, uh, and as well as uh, drop the heating loads because the get glass is a bit, this glass was a bit that was selected had better insulating quality. So that changes the heat amount of heating that you need. And in this case, it dropped the amount of borehole that you needed from 24,000 feet of drilling down to about 22,000 feet of drilling, saved about $40,000 and keeping the temperature range fairly similar. Other things that can be done is looking at exhaust air energy recovery. Air in commercial buildings, in any building, you've got to introduce fresh air to the building to keep it comfortable and you've got exhaust air. So if you're exhausting 70 degree air to the outdoors and bringing in minus 30 degree air, air in from outside, you've got to heat that air. If you can recover the energy from that air, that changes the cooling loads, that changes the heating loads. And again, that's going to change the amount of, uh, may change the amount of borehole that you need to maintain the temperatures. In this case, it didn't change as much. In this case, we're looking at, uh, looking at both systems uh, and that that's going to vary depending on the type of building, size of the building and where it's located. The other thing that makes a difference in this case, the thing that was added, uh, a multifamily building, an apartment building, people in the building are going to have a shower uh, every day and use the laundry and whatever else. They're going to have a certain hot water demand. That water has to be heated and by actually increasing the amount of heating load, what we're doing is changing the energy balance. And in this case, that dropped it from 22,000 feet of drilling to about 17,000 feet of drilling. That's pretty significant. You're looking at about $100,000 in cost of the system. That's gonna change the economics of the whole system. So you're doing more, you're, pretty, uh, you're actually making the system more efficient. And at the same time, you're reducing the capital cost to build it. The other thing that makes a difference is how you're where, how you how you're designing the ground heat exchanger. The space between the boreholes has an impact on how much the boreholes are going to interfere with each other. You shove a whole bunch of uh, heat into the dirt, that's going to dissipate into the ground gradually. And if you've got another borehole right next to it, that's going to raise the temperature of that whole mass of dirt. So if you space that out a bit farther. Um, and looking at um, or change, uh, change the way the layout is. This is a square grid. This is a, a, a grid that's maybe two by 30 boreholes. This is 12 by 12 boreholes, 72,000 feet of drilling to 31,000 feet of drilling. You're looking at cutting the cost by more than half, simply by how you've designed, lay, laid out the borehole field. Some other things that can be done is change the spacing between the boreholes. Again, we've dropped the, drop, uh, in this case, it didn't change much. Um, here, looking at putting uh, more conductive material in the space around the borehole, uh, so the heat transfers to and from the pipe more readily, dropped it another 4,000 feet. Here, we're looking at uh, putting in, installing more efficient heat pumps in the system, and that changes how much compressor energy has to be shoved into the ground versus how much heat has to be extracted from the ground when the system is heating. So that's dropped it down from 72,000 feet down to 24,000 feet, simply by how the ground heat exchanger is designed. So rules of thumb really can't take into consideration all of those different variables with any, with any kind of accuracy. So using, using that, uh, that website, you can actually look at, get a full printed report of the type of building that you're looking at. So if you're looking at, at an office building in Fergus Falls or in, uh, in Fargo or wherever you're looking at, uh, you can get an estimate of what the energy lo loads would be of that building. The same building with better glass, the same building with a better ventilation system or a combination of things or adding the domestic hot water in some buildings, all of those things can make a big difference. And it'll help you take into account many of those variables. It's not going to give you a number for your specific building because that, the only way to do that properly is to build an energy model for your specific building. But it can give you, give you a much better, it's a much better uh, estimate than typical rules of thumb of 400 square feet per ton or 200 feet of drilling per ton. 
this can change it pretty significantly. And one, one thing of, with the work that we've done with otter tail power over the last number of years, when you compare the size of the, the cost of the ground heat exchanger based on typical rules of thumb that are used before anybody's done any kind of energy modeling, we've typically been able to reduce the size and the cost if we've had the opportunity to work with the architect and the building owner and the mechanical designers by anywhere between 35 up to as much as 65%. So that has a huge impact on the economics, return on investment, the symbol payback, however you want to look at it. So you can get access to this uh, tool uh, working with Otter Tail Power to on your computer or phone or whatever, you can run a system like that through the software in about 10 minutes. So that hopefully that gives you a bit of a background on what geothermal system is, systems are, what they, what they can do, and how to make them more cost effective to build and operate more efficiently. So the other thing that I want to talk about a little bit is some of the things that are happening in the industry now. There's a number of things that are helping to make this system better. One of the things that's uh, being developed is um, a, a way to monitor how much energy is being pushed into the ground in real time versus how much is being pulled out of the ground. And that's done by adding an energy meter to the ground heat exchanger. How many BTUs are you trying to shove into the ground? How many are you pulling out on an annual basis? And what does that do to the temperature of the ground loop? And the second thing is, um, energy sharing. For example, if you've got an office building adjacent to, uh, to a school that's adjacent to uh, an apartment building, for example, or a bunch of single family homes, the energy load profiles of each of those different types of buildings, because the buildings are being used in different ways, um, are gonna have their peak heating and cooling loads at different times of day. Uh, an office building is going to have a peak cooling load typically you know, three or four or five in the afternoon when the sun is beating in on the building and the there's a most people in the building uh, lights are all on computers are all on that's when the cooling load is going to reach its peak meanwhile the apartment building next door uh it's not going to start need, requiring a whole lot of cooling until you know people get home from work about five or six in the afternoon and they start cooking dinner and things like that and the load profile is different. So it's not the sum of the peak, the loads that's, that you're looking at. What you're doing is looking at the peak load of the whole group of buildings at the same time. So that, that way you can, and you can also share energy. If you've got one building that's rejecting heat to the ground, another heat building that's pulling heat from the ground, that can be beneficial to both. So, when we're looking at uh, things like uh, monitoring the system, and you can actually manage how much energy you're putting into the ground. For example, you can divert some of the heat away from the ground loop and dissipate it into a snowmelt system. That was done in an IKEA store in Denver a couple of number of years ago, where they've got 35,000 square feet of area in the loading docks. All that's there, it's there for is to dissipate excess heat divert it away from the ground heat exchanger and get, make, make some beneficial use of it. It happens to melt snow when, when, it, uh, when it does snow in Denver, but most of the time we can dump heat whether there's snow there or not. So it's a, what, what I would term a discretionary heating, in, or heating load. We can divert heat away from the ground loop, avoid putting it into the ground, ground, avoid having to build more ground loop and make some beneficial use of that heat at the same time. Other things, if you happen to have, a, have an ice rink adjacent to a swimming pool, that energy can easily be shared. You're, all you're doing in an ice rink is getting rid of heat. The cooling tower is running all winter long. The uh, swimming pool next door may require heat for heating the pool, or pool water, uh, showers, and whatever else are being used. That's a very beneficial use of all of, all of that heat. Or there's uh, working with otter tail power on a project in, uh, in Purim. Uh, by being able to change the tint of the glass on the building, we can change the heating loads and the cooling loads by about 25%. So in other words, instead of requiring 100 tons of cooling, we can reduce that to 20, uh, 75 tons, simply by inducing a small electric current into the glass that changes the amount of heat that's gained from the sun, and that changes how much heat we're trying to shove into the ground. That changes the amount of pipe that we need 
to service that load. So that, that's starting to come into the industry more and more. Uh, those kinds of you know, different kinds of things. And you can look at a whole bunch of different ways of uh, using energy. You can add solar thermal energy to the, to the ground loop, for example, and add heat to the ground loop if you need to. So what we're trying to do with that is avoid dropping the temperature over time or increasing the temperature over time, make it level uh, and using loads that we don't really need to service, but we have the opportunity to take advantage of them, uh, we can still maintain the good comfort levels in the building and make some beneficial use of the excess heat that you need or take advantage of waste heat that you would otherwise dump into the atmosphere. Like combined heat and power, for example, heat can be dumped into a ground heat exchanger rather than just dissipating it through the atmosphere. So we're basically trying to avoid, trying to balance the loads that we're trying to shove into in and out of the ground. Uh, in my own house, for example, uh, what I've done, because uh, you're all aware of how cold it gets in our climate uh, in the winter, minus 40, we do maybe 200, 250 hours of air conditioning on a typical year. Uh, my house runs about 2,500 hours, about 10 times as much for heating. So I'm extracting a whole lot more heat from the ground than, I'm try than I can put back into it. So what I've done in the last year is add a small solar panel to the roof, dump it into the ground heat exchanger and try and balance those loads. So what I found is that the, that the ground heat exchanger, the ambient ground temperature in Winnipeg is about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, the ground temperature is about 53 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, I've never seen it that high before. So I'm basically using that to balance the, the, the amount of heat that's going in, into the ground versus how much is coming out. So a couple of years ago, the coldest, the temperature in my ground that, that my heat pump saw was less than 24 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, by this winter, I'm expecting to be increased by about four or five degrees. The other thing that I'd mentioned earlier was taking advantage of the ability to share energy from one building to, a ne to the next. And that can be done by simply creating um, connecting all the buildings to one single pipe. Think of it as a conveyor belt to move energy around. This building is actually in, uh, in heating mode. It's drawing heat from the ground. The building adjacent to it is dumping heat into the ground. So if the fluid is going this way, this one's warming up the fluid and this one's cooling off the fluid. At this, if, if that is fairly balanced, we don't even need a ground loop. The, where we do need a ground loop is when most of the buildings are cooling or most of the buildings are heating. Energy that we store, it dumped into the ground last summer, we can pull out this winter. And the ground becomes basically essentially an energy storage medium. And because we're sharing energy a lot, we can design a system that has uh, less pipe in the ground. It's less expensive to build and works more efficiently. And simply laying a pipe in, in the street in front of the buildings can be done. That's, that's being done. There's uh, uh, Colorado Mesa University has done that for a couple of years. Um, the, they started building their system about eight or nine or 10 years ago. Um, Missouri State University of Science and Technology's uh, system is somewhat, somewhat similar to that. So there's, there, are, there are systems, there, you're starting to see systems that are being developed as district energy systems. There's heat pumps in each building, and they just simply draw heat from this pipe or dump heat into that pipe. And uh, if you've got a diverse, a fairly diverse mix of buildings, that can be really, really beneficial. If all the buildings are the same, the heating and cooling load profiles are going to be the same. But this is going to be, if, if you've got some diverse loads, and university campuses are really good for that simply because they've typically got a residence, uh, residence buildings. Uh, classroom buildings, office buildings, they all operate differently. They've got bookstores, whatever else. And they can benefit by being connected to this same ground loop. If you've got a university campus, for example, that has an ice rink, that can dump heat into the, into the ground loop and that can be shared with all of the other buildings around it. So example, uh, this is um, a university campus. It, a system like that can be built. You, connecting these, in this case, these five buildings with a single pipe, 
and there they will this one might be heat, taking heat from it this might be heating dumping heat into it sharing the energy the amount of ground loop that you need is typically maybe 10 to 20 to 30 percent less than if you had an individual ground heat exchanger for each one of these that system can be easily expanded add another four buildings over here and then you can connect those two two se separate loops up and gra uh, gradually expand it to the whole campus so it can be built out over a number of years in a modular way which reduces the amount of capital cost you need up front you can expand that system as you've got the budget and as you need to change things in the buildings anyway so if you've got an existing building existing building some of these buildings are going to have to replace chillers and boilers at some point in the next 20 or 30 years anyway if you design it accordingly and, and design a system that can take advantage of the energy sharing from one building to the next that can be expanded over the next 10 to 20 30 years and gradually get to the point where you're uh, not burning fossil fuels at all and still fit within budgets to a reasonable degree so basically what i'm suggesting is that it's possible to design a system that will offer you a solid return on your investment if you have the opportunity to work with the, with your architect with your mechanical system designer and the building owner and really use the science that's available with uh, in energy modeling software to really inform the design inform the architects and here's what you, here's what the implications are if you put in this kind of glass versus this kind of glass or if you install this kind of an insulation system versus that kind um, or you know depending on how much insulation you put in the walls and those kinds of things those, those can all have an impact then you can also take advantage of things like combined heat and power uh, where waste heat from a combined heat and power plant can be rejected into the ground loop if you need it those kinds of things can all be added into it solar thermal can be added into it a whole bunch of different things can be done to to complement the capacity and the efficiency of a geothermal system and the ground heat exchanger then basically, basically becomes a place to store extra energy when you can't use it and a place to draw energy from when you're not producing it so it can provide you a much better return on your investment it can reduce the risk of a, of a system by managing the way the system is is operating and understanding how much energy you're dealing with on a, on a real-time basis that can take into account the difference in the in, in the climate from, or the weather from one year to the next you may have a very cold year one year may have a very warm year than the next and this can help you manage that and still maintain its operating efficiency for the life of the life of the project and it will operate more efficiently so it'll be, provide a better return on investment and reduce the risk at the same time and then again it's going to continue to reduce co2 emissions and energy consumption and these systems can be designed to work almost anywhere we've had the opportunity to work uh, on a project in siberia russia a couple number of years ago where we we're taking heat out of permafrost to heat a ha aircraft hangar and at the same time to maintain the permafrost so that the foundation isn't going to shift as well as a project in uh, in um, in the outback in australia where the ground temperature is about 75 or 80 degrees fahrenheit uh, again you can make you can uh, as long as you know what the energy loads are you can deal with those kinds of things so uh, just a couple of examples and uh, we've got time for a number of questions if you have any more than happy to try and answer them well thank you uh ed we we do have one question that popped up in the chat um ray asked did you say you need to work with otter tail to use uh fees no um, it's it's designed to work as um, on a subscription basis there is a free version of it that doesn't allow you to do uh, change the, the default values but uh, you can go onto the site and use the free version and on a subscription basis it can be uh, can be uh, you can have full access to it if you want to give me a call or email me happy to Chat with you about that. Any other questions from anybody at all? Or yep, one popped up from Lissa. 
inserts, is this also geared toward impacting the industry itself to encourage companies to do more detailed estimates to improve overall satisfaction from ground source heat pump projects? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. It, it really is important to look at, under, to really understand the amount of energy you're dealing with. And with, with by, do, by taking the approach that we've done, really concentrating on the energy modeling and understanding those loads, it's possible to really reduce the size and the cost of a payback. For example, we did um, three feasibility studies for the city of Toronto uh, a couple of years ago and uh, on three buildings. One is a school about 110,000 square feet. The other one was um, a typical um, office building, a civic center, about 75,000 square feet, and their emergency call center, about 175,000 square feet building. And on each of those, what we did, and those were existing buildings, each about 30 years old, and they had to, they were at the point where the boilers and chillers had to be replaced anyway. Uh, one of the buildings, they were looking at changing the glass. The other one, they were changing the lighting system in there. Uh, so we, basically what we did was take and um, do an energy audit of the building, basically create an inventory of how energy is being used, how much energy is being used to produce hot water, how much is being used to uh, run the lights or the computers and whatever else there is in the building and then really quantify that. And that gives us a really good number on how much, what the heating and cooling loads are with uh, fairly accurately. And we combined that with doing an actual energy model of the building and calibrating that energy model to, uh, to match the existing energy consumption. And then into that energy model, we built in the energy efficiency measures such as the ventilation system or the glass or the lighting or whatever else is being considered, build that into the energy model and see what that did to the size of the ground loop. And by the end of it, each one of those projects ended up with a simple payback between four and eight years. Um, the city is going ahead and their, their principal driver for the city of Toronto is to reduce carbon emissions. And uh, they're actually gonna be building all three of those uh, geothermal systems into those buildings in the next year. Wow, four to eight year payback. Um, we have a next one uh, question here from Dennis and Moorhead. For district systems, I see where this would work with, co with a college campus, but what about a residential group with different owners? Who is responsible for maintenance of fluid if one person system causes problems? Um, there's a system, we're looking at a system right now in Halifax and uh, there have been systems, we've looked at a system in uh, actually for the city of Woodstock, Ontario, uh, a couple of years ago, a city of about 40,000 people. And what the, our client was basically somebody had wanted to build a geothermal utility and they were basically treating it as, as a utility where they would own, operate and manage the ground heat exchanger and the piping connections to each of the homes. And then there would be heat exchanger in the home so that they could connect to it without affecting the system. They would own the, um, the utility would own the pipe in the ground and uh, the homeowner would connect the heat pump to it, just like he would connect a, a gas furnace to a gas line. And so there, that, that kind of thing is starting to happen. I see that happening more and more often. We looked at a system in, uh, but a 7,500 home development uh, just near San Ramon, California, a couple of years ago as well. Um, some of them are starting to go, go ahead. There's a system in a place called Whisper Valley in near Austin, Texas, that is being installed with the geothermal system in every home. And I, I, some investment group or whatever is, is owning and operating the utility, like a utility, and, uh, and managing it. And, um, starting to see that kind of thing happening. What's happening in Massachusetts, for example, National Grid and, um, and um, another utility, Eversource, I think it is, um, they're actually starting to consider, instead of replacing the gas pipelines that they've got in place that have to be replaced now they're, because they're leaking like crazy, uh, they're installing geothermal pipes in the ground instead of gas pipelines. And uh, they're, beginning to set up uh, geothermal utilities instead of gas utilities. So that's, uh, there's, there's a number of different uh, things that different ways that this can be approached, whether it's just purely financing um, or whether it's setting up 
up as a utility. There's 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 a number of different ways that that can be done. Okay. We have another question from uh, Lisa here. What's the starter pitch for a community to help them think about considering district systems? And are there any Minnesota communities going with this direction? Do you have advice about what information a potential community would need to gather as pre-screening for this sort of approach? Um, we're looking at a campus, uh, Bemidji State University right now, that's looking at, uh, we're trying to create a roadmap for them, how, they, how to get there most cost effectively. Over the, and they're, they're basically committed to um, eliminating their CO2 emissions by 2050. And how can they do that with their existing buildings which are currently heated with a gas pipeline? So we're basically starting to gather the information, how much energy are they using, trying to quantify how much energy we're dealing with, and then trying to figure out how much uh, pipe we need to put in the dirt to make that system work. And taking into consideration how the energy, how much energy can be transferred from one building to the next, and when it would be most effective to install a geothermal system on which of their buildings. They're going to have to replace, over the next 20 or 30 years, they're going to have to replace the heating system on most of those buildings anyway. So if we can provide guidance as to how, what they can do to the building to make it more cost effective to build the geothermal system, that can be beneficial. If we're looking at a, at a town, for example, um, Probably if it was all single family homes, uh, the energy load profile you'd see on a single, on a bunch of single family homes would all be very similar. But if you've got a mix of buildings, for example, if you've got a, a, probably a really good example of that is if there is an ice rink in the community, ice rink has to get rid of a lot of heat all winter long. That can be injected into the ground loop. And then the homes that are you know, 30 or 40 or 50 homes that are around it, can all benefit from that because that maintains the warmer temperatures in the ground loop. Instead of having plumes of, uh, of uh, water vapor uh, uh, coming out of the cooling tower and dissipating a, you know, a million, million or two million kilowatt hours worth of energy into the atmosphere every year, when it's minus 30 or minus 40, it's a lot more beneficial if you can reject that heat into the ground heat exchanger and then pick it up with the houses that are around it. So if you've got a diverse group of buildings around a, around a heat source and that could be a data center. Uh, could be, there's all kinds of buildings that uh, processing plants of some sort may reject a lot of heat. Uh, we're, one of the projects we're looking at, there's a brewery in, this is in Halifax. They, in their process, they use a lot of heat to, uh, to in, in the malting process and that I'm not familiar with what they're doing, but we'll get some numbers on how much, how many BTUs they're dealing with. Um, that can benefit all the whole bunch of homes that are that are surrounding that that brewery. So th it really depends on the community. If you're looking at all single-family homes, it becomes more challenging because that doesn't reduce the size of the ground very much. But if you've got a mix of uses around that community and you can you can tie them all together, that's where it's the, where the biggest benefits are. For example, the IKEA store in Denver, it has to get rid of ten times more heat than it needs to heat the building, simply because the lighting and uh, things like that. Um, <clears throat> Ray has a comment, I guess, and a question, but uh, lots of heat pump technology becoming visible, water heaters, air source splits, et cetera. Who is promoting ground source? Um, I'm probably one of the biggest proponents of ground source systems anywhere, but there's the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association that uh, a lot of people that are involved in the industry belong to. Um, and uh, there's a, um, a state organization in Minnesota, Minnesota Geothermal Association. There's other organizations in New York, for example, New York Geothermal, um, in the, uh, Illinois uh, Geothermal Alliance of Illinois, uh, California Geo. There's a number of associations that are promoting this. Uh, plastic pipe industry is, uh, is certainly promoting it uh, because they s basically supply a lot of pipe to the industry. Um, but there are, there are a number of organizations that can help provide information if you want that and uh, developing industry standards on how to design systems and how to uh, you know, provide training and that kind of thing as well. Uh, <clears throat> 
The first time you and I spoke, Ed, um, uh, it was a discussion about the Darcy system. And as I remember, that was drawing the heat or, or using water. Um, is, could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. What, what that is, it's kind of an interesting um, uh, take on how to use well water itself or groundwater itself as a heat source and a heat sink. The groundwater in, in Minnesota is probably around 48, 49, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And what has been done a lot of times over the years is extract water from the well, run us through a heat pump, and then either dump it into a nearby stream or dump it back into the ground in another well. What these guys are doing is a bit different. They're essentially installing a heat exchanger in the well. Uh, you may have a layer of water at uh, 150 feet below the ground. You may have another layer of water, uh, another uh, zone of water producing uh, water producing area at uh, let's say 75 feet. So if you install a heat exchanger, a pump and a heat exchanger in there to take water from the uh, 150 foot level, run that water within the in across the heat exchanger that's inside the well, and dissipate that water into the 75 foot level. You can extract heat from that water, so that, you know, either cool it in the winter or warm it the water in the summertime. And uh, that, then you can use the well water without actually taking the water out of the ground. Uh, a bit less intrusive onto the, in the aquifer and uh, can, can take advantage of the, the groundwater that way. And it can be a little, little more cost effective in some cases than a closed loop system where you're bearing plastic pipe in the ground. Or you can use it in combination with a closed loop system to help manage the temperature of the ground heat exchanger, the, the closed loop ground heat exchanger. So it's a pretty interesting system uh, developed by some guys at the University of Minnesota. Um, here's another question. Does Minnesota Geothermal Association have any standards for members to use uh, more specifics on design, system design? Uh, there is a binational standard uh, created by the uh, uh, ANSI and CSA and um, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association that was uh, developed, I guess, about four years ago, about 2016. Um, and that has a number of standards that have been, it's starting to be adopted by, uh, by state building code, uh, people that have jurisdiction over building codes and that kind of thing. Um, so there are, there are standards on how the pipe needs to be put in the ground, what kind of pipe is used, uh, how the system needs to be designed, that kind of thing. So there are standards, and I think the, a lot of the regional associations um, have or will be adopting that, that standard. Okay. Um, one other question is, why wouldn't you always use high conductivity grout? Is not an option sometimes, or? Um, no, it is an option, and what we will do is we'll model uh, there's software that will model how the performance changes if you install grout that conducts heat more readily. And it, it basically boils down to an economic um, equation, really. Uh, it, it, are you going to spend an extra dollar or two to put the high conductivity grout in each foot of borehole? Does that save you enough drilling to pay for the, pay for the cost for the grout? And, and it, it's basically an economic decision. Okay. Any further questions? Well, or... I'm not seeing any more come through unless I miss some. Anybody else is looking at the chat? You can certainly unmute too if, <clears throat> if somebody, if I missed you, I apologize. If you, um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to chat with you if you, know, you want to. Um, you've got my phone number and email address on screen right now, I think. So I'm more than happy to chat with you that, uh, at, at your convenience. Well, good. We're coming up on the hour anyway here, Ed. So um, I want to thank you for your time. Very interesting. And encourage our entire group to, to reach out to Ed as he just invited you to do. But also reach out to myself or, or anybody um, with certs. Um, probably speak for Roger too, if, if you have something specific for him, he would, he's always great about um, answering the call. So um, 
yeah, let's continue the conversation. That's a lot of times where um, more of the things happen is after you have a chance to digest things and think about them is those follow-up questions. So thank you. Autotail Power has a very good geothermal uh, program uh, that provides design assistance as, uh, as well as incentives uh, to install geothermal systems. But uh, it's certainly commercial systems. Uh, I think they're, are they in residential as well, Roger? I don't know. I think maybe Roger had to step away for a different meeting. 